My name is Chris Farrell, and I'm the Director of Investigations and Research for Judicial Watch. I hope that all of you know about Judicial Watch and what it is that we do and how we do it. And I'm going to talk a little bit this morning on a topic that is not having to do with uh, Mueller, Comey, Strzok, Page, and the whole cast of characters. I'm going to talk today uh, on a subject that I've been looking at, I guess, for the last 14 years or so. And I entitled my presentation, uh, Forgetting Beslan. And a couple of friends of mine said, forget it. I didn't even know what it is or what it was. And so this is my first time talking to you. And so I figured I didn't want to do anything controversial. So I'd talk about terrorism, children as intended targets of terrorism, uh, school safety, um, and our very poor southern border. Didn't want to be controversial. Uh, I come to this. I've been at Judicial Watch for 20 years, um, heading up their investigative and research work. And prior to that, I think I want to provide you some context to understand sort of the lenses through which I view this topic, really my work overall at Judicial Watch, but in particular this topic. And that is in my past life, pre-Judicial Watch, uh, I was an Army counterintelligence officer. And I specialized principally in doing counterespionage work and in that regard, uh, conducting counterespionage investigations, but also running double agent operations. I commanded the Army's surveillance team. We did physical, technical, and aerial surveillance of counterintelligence operations, but also human intelligence, active spying operations, um, to see what the bad guys were doing and to make sure that our guys were in good shape. And I also had the great privilege of providing uh, direct support to the close target surveillance squadron of Delta Force uh, as an intelligence officer providing assistance to them. So when I look at this topic, when I work at, look at my work at Judicial Watch, I'm not looking at it necessarily from a legal perspective with, res with respect to being a, an attorney or a lawyer, because I am not one. I'm an intelligence officer by background and training. Uh, and that's how I look at this stuff. And that's whether it's a, a FOIA request to the Department of Justice or whether the topic we're going to talk about today uh, forgetting Beslan, or hopefully not forgetting Beslan. It's a forgotten chapter. A lot of people say, Beslan, yeah, that's some terror thing in Russia, and, and then it gets blurry. It shouldn't get blurry, and I'm going to explain to you why here in a few minutes. Uh, it's my intention to provoke you. <laughs> All right, I'm going to say and present facts and images and data that is not necessarily pleasant or fun or easy. Uh, but I think it's terribly important. So I'm going to stir some memories. I'm going to provoke some thoughts. Um, this is not, you know, obviously most of you have a background in medicine and science and engineering. Uh, I come from this from the dark arts side of the world, so this is not necessarily a hard science thing. But the, uh, the facts are disturbing. The lessons, I think, that we can learn from this are very compelling. And... Uh, as of about two weeks ago, it couldn't be any more real when you think about what's gone on in New Mexico recently. Okay, let's get going. Beslan. Beslan was a, or is, a city in North Ossetia, which is in the Caucasus, re Caucasus region of Russia. I'll give you a map in a second. There was a horrific school siege that took place there by Islamic Chechen terrorists in 2004. Uh, I'll give you some numbers and stats on how all that played out. But the imagery I have here is horrific, right? There's a child being carried out of a building where a raid had just occurred, actually explosions, and then a, a failed raid. Uh, an open-air mortuary operation where bodies were left out for nearly two weeks. And then a memorial wall, wall of uh, hundreds of kids that were killed in this raid. So on September 1st, 2004, the very first day of school in Beslan, everyone shows up. It's a big day of celebration. Uh, families, local officials, everything you'd imagine. And within minutes of the opening day ceremony, 32 militant Islamists, including two black widows. Everybody know what a black widow is? Black widows are uh, female and very often suicide bombers. Uh, who have lost their <clears throat> husband, father, brother, whatever, and in their mourning have decided to act out 
uh, as terrorists themselves. And uh, they figure prominently in Chechen terrorism. They figure prom and the reason why I talk about Chechen terrorism so much is because it's really sort of a, almost a test bed or a proving ground for techniques and tactics that are later employed elsewhere in the militant Islamist world. So it's important. Um, so 32 militant Islamists pull up in a couple of vehicles. They storm the building. They catch essentially everyone by surprise. Uh, and they take control of Beslan school number one. Um, it's a 53-hour siege that ends horribly. Initially, there's about 1,200 hostages that are taken. But the total body count, the deaths involved, are 344 with 186 children, one as young as six months, all the way up to 16 years old. The reason why at a school they got a hold of a six-month uh, six child is that since it was the opening day, all the families and everybody showed up. So young mom or family's walking in to take the second grader in, and of course the little brother or sister's there in arms. And they were all swept up by these guys as they raided the building. So a horrific body count, and of course 700 seriously injured. So you said to yourself, well, Chechnya, North Ossetia, what are you talking about? We're in the Caucasus region, and Chechnya, which has, been, has its own history I'll talk about in a second, is right there. Grozny is pretty much dead center, the capital of Chechnya. And then Beslan, the city in North Ossetia that we're talking about, is right about there. Travel time from Grozny to, North, uh, to Beslan, about an hour and a half. That gives you an idea of geography as far as scale is concerned. But we're in the Caucasus. North Ossetia is principally a Christian uh, enclave or community. Chechnya is Islamists, which is also part of the dynamic in all of this, as you might imagine. So Chechen terrorism is particularly brutal and nasty. The Chechens themselves fought two wars in the 1990s with the Russians. It was horrific. The Chechens themselves have engaged in a series, leading up to Beslan, have engaged in a series of incredibly violent, really kind of boundary-breaking terror raids. One, a hospital siege uh, that ended poorly. Again, a three-day siege. The Russian forces uh, raided the hospital itself. Uh, it did not turn out well. They also conducted a theater siege that some of you may remember, the Dubrovka theater siege. That's where 750, terror, uh, 750 hostages were held. Um, what's interesting is Russian special forces uh, who actually raided the theater itself uh, used a gaseous uh, substance to knock out everyone in the theater to conduct their raid. And uh, fentanyl is believed to be the component that actually kind of subdued everyone. They killed a bunch of people in the process, unfortunately, during the raid itself. Um, fentanyl will come up at the very, very end of my presentation, uh, sort of a preview of something I'd like you to think about. But this Dubrovka theater uh, siege was particularly brutal and crazy because this is the first instance where you see these black widows I mentioned earlier, these female suicide bombers, completely dressed in black, wearing these vests. And the problem that the Russian Special Forces had in even dealing with the siege, and of course the Chechen demands <clears throat> are non-negotiable surrender kind of demands, right? All Russian forces must leave Chechnya. It's this broad sweeping things that no Russian government's going to do. So th these are one-way trips, okay? These attacks are not something that's going to be walked and talked out. Uh, these are all, you know, sort of propaganda by deed if you go back 120 years. Uh, when it comes to what they're trying to accomplish. And um, to give you an idea of the mentality, at one point, and this is from witnesses, from people who were hostages, the hostage takers, the Chechens in the theater with their captive audience, were screaming at them, we want to die more than you want to live. That's the mindset. The terrorists want to die more than the hostages want to live. That's how they operate. That's what they're there for. They've engaged in a campaign of train, truck, and stadium bombings. Um, and then probably one of the more sophisticated operations they pulled off was uh, two women in aircraft uh, hijacked from Moscow 
with a simultaneous suicide bombing on the aircraft. Both aircraft blew up within nine seconds of each other. So if you want to talk about sophistication, planning, detail, the ability to pull off an operation, commitment to it, the logistics of it, the timing, all those components, these are not people to be trifled with. This is not a ragtag, slapdash operation. It's synchronized, it's serious, and it's incredibly deadly. Best on, when I, we're going to talk about the details of it in a second, but sort of one of the, the, the takeaways is that they viewed it as an incredible victory. You know, they've accomplished the unthinkable. They have targeted children deliberately. They are the targets of terrorism. The lessons of all this terrorism are not forgotten or lost. They're implemented, right? They're duplicated, they're adapted. And over time, uh, Chechnya and Chechen terror operations have really proved to be sort of a test bed. IEDs, improvised explosive devices, Chechen. In the 90s, implemented or used against Russian forces in those two wars I talked about a few couple of slides back. They're the people who dreamed it up. Let's take old artillery shells, old mortar shells. Let's adapt and use them. How can we, how can we maximize uh, you know, a stockpile of shells from a, from a facility we've raided and taken over and use them offensively? We may not have the artillery tubes to fire them, but we can modify the, the, the artillery rounds themselves and use them in a way to blow up people, vehicles, munitions, et cetera. And frankly, before Beslan, I don't think anyone envisioned a pediatric mass casualty event like that. People would think of instances where there would be casualties, but mixed, but not specifically a pediatric mass casualty incident. And for my colleagues, medical doctors that I've worked with on this subject, uh, you know, what do I know about medicine? You know, zero. But you know, it's not okay. Well, cut the Tylenol in half and give it to the kid, right? There's unique, specialized medical questions with respect to treating children, particularly when it comes to shrapnel wounds from gunfire, all those issues. It's just an entirely different set of medical requirements that frankly have not been evaluated or thought about. So here's the thinking. And this is always somewhat poisonous. This makes you kind of want to wash after you read it. Suleiman Abu Ghaith, who is currently a guest of the United States in the Supermax in Florence, Colorado, thank goodness. Um, here's his thinking, though. We have not reached parity with America. We have the right to kill four million Americans, two million of them children, and to exile twice as many and wound and cripple hundreds of thousands. So he's actually an in-law of, of bin Laden, or had, was an in-law of bin Laden, al-Qaeda spokesman. That's from 2001, his, one of his proclamations, and I'm very glad that he's locked up. But this is not just one guy spouting off. This is documentation, right? And I'm a big believer in actually reading what our enemy says they're going to do to us and why they're doing it and how they're doing it. We ignore it at our peril. So there's a document that talks specifically about killing women and children. And there's the language. The sanctity of women, children, and the elderly is not absolute, which is contrary to a lot of other propaganda you've heard where it's, oh, it's only combatants, and no, it's not. Killing Americans who are ordinarily off limits, Muslims should not exceed 4 million non-combatants or render more than 10 million of them homeless. This is their language, their documentation, their thinking. This is what they're instructing their followers, their operators to do. So Beslan is seized. The school itself is seized. And this is sort of the, what happened. This is the, a diagram or a layout of how the the building itself, what, what was done. So the figures in red are obviously the terrorists, figures in blue are the children and some of the parents. And then around the room and across the room, so literally the perimeter and then overhead and then on top of basketball hoops, they strung explosive devices. The Chechens had experience from the Dubrov Dubrovka theater raid and they didn't ever want to be gassed again and, and rendered knocked out. So all the windows are blown out of the building. 
They start drilling holes in the floors of the gym because they don't want anybody sneaking in underneath them and launching an assault. They learn from their past, they, they implement, they adapt. It's very thoughtful. These are not reckless yahoos. They are very deliberate in what they're doing. So that gives you an idea of sort of the configuration of the layout of the, of the main room in which most of the hostages were held. And this is one of these things where it's very good, but it's very bad, because I'm gonna show you video now of what was going on inside the school. This is a glimpse into the nightmare. Shaky video apparently taken at the beginning of the hostages' three-day ordeal. At this point, the terrorists were still putting together their homemade bombs and stringing cables from the basketball hoops with more explosives. At one end of the gym, a terrorist shows the hostages his foot on a book rigged as a switch to detonate the bomb. There are only the briefest shots of hundreds of hostages cowering on the floor. Children, families, grandmothers, some with their hands over their heads. A woman walks past the door holding an infant and a baby bottle. A group of men is off to the side, facing the wall. A voice off camera, apparently one of the hostage takers, says, Wait, don't bring the children in here yet. Wait until everyone gets out. It's not clear what he's referring to, but the hostages are moving around, and witnesses say the children were allowed to go to the bathroom five at a time, picking their way through the wires and ducking under the bombs. In a doorway on the far side of the room, the shadowy form of a woman terrorist, dressed in black, her pistol cocked, the wires from her explosive belt clearly visible. One detail the unknown cameraman made a point of showing, a trail of blood running the length of the floor. Eyewitnesses say one man was killed in front of them and dragged away. At one point, another conversation is audible, possibly a voice speaking into a phone, saying in Arabic, for the sake of God and God willing. The Russians had claimed some of the hostage takers were Arabs, but these phrases are used by Muslims all over the world. NTV won't reveal how it got the pictures, and we don't know why they were made, but the grainy images capture a terrible moment. A room densely packed with people still praying for their lives, prayers which for so many were in vain. Elizabeth Palmer, CBS News, Moscow. That's pretty compelling stuff, or at least it is to me, and you can imagine what these people were going through. We'll talk about some of the impacts and consequences of being in that environment in a little bit. The terrorists themselves, there's actually, I think, a pretty informative, another little brief clip I want to share with you. The bearded man is considered to be the commander of the terrorists. Survivors told us he was called the Colonel. His real name is Ruslan Kuchborov. He's from Chechnya, the republic at war with Russia. The man the colonel is speaking with is negotiator Ruslan Aushev. Aushev, a former Russian army general, now politician, was the only outsider to meet face to face with the terrorists. The terrorist leader told Aushev he was willing to negotiate for the release of the hostages. But before anyone would be released, the colonel took Aushev on a tour of the school. Along the way, at least 10 other terrorists can be seen. Aushev is then led to a bloody classroom on the second floor. Among the dead are teachers, school employees, and fathers. With the colonel and negotiator Aushev watching, the mothers painfully walked out the door. Each of these mothers was leaving an older child behind. In all, 11 mothers carried out 14 babies. The last moment, a terrorist handed another baby to Aushev. The boy's mother just couldn't leave her older child behind. So, <clears throat> another glimpse into what was going on in the school itself. I've already talked about an elaborate network of IEDs with backup power, dead man switches. They showed that literally in the film itself. 
Again, they learn from past experiences, so they barricade doors, they rig them with explosive devices, all the windows are broken out, holes in the floors, they're anticipating a raid that's going to be launched on them. They're very heavily armed. One of the Black Widows uh, is actually, later on I'll, I'll highlight this, but one of the Black Widows themselves was actually detonated by the guy who was referred to as the Colonel. It appears that at some point they had lied to the crew that was conducting the raid as to the details of what they were trying to accomplish. One of the women, one of the Black Widows, at some point became distraught. She was in a, in a room with a lot of the dads that were there because they were using dads to move furniture around and create barricades. So she gets in a fight, a verbal altercation with the guy you saw with the beard, the colonel. And as punishment and to demonstrate their commitment to the operation, she's in the room with the dads and the grandfathers that are there, and he detonates her. They very closely monitored media, the terrorists monitored media. They wanted to know what was being said, how it was being characterized, what was being done. And the media, of course, were just pumping out everything they could and would say about what was going on. And they were keenly aware of that. It becomes a real issue at one point because the Russian government tried to downplay this, the hostage situation. They said there were only 334 hostages. That infuriated the terrorists. They wanted credit for having 1,200, 1,300 people. They felt insulted by the Russian media trying to, or the Russian government through the media trying to downplay what they were doing. It became a sticking point. It wasn't just a matter of, I don't agree with your numbers. This was a motivator to them. And interestingly, in this part of the Caucasus, you know, they kind of have their own history and their own tradition and their own culture and their own way of life despite, you know, the, the legacy of Stalin. So all the civilians in the area happen to be heavily armed. Surprise, surprise. You know, there wasn't a household in, in the little town of Beslan, about 30,000 people in Beslan. There wasn't a household that didn't have a shotgun. And the local civilian population had seen what had happened in previous raids by Russian special forces on these kind of Chechen terrorist events. And they threatened the army and the FSB troops that were there. And said, if you raid this building, if you kill our kids, we're killing you. So a whole other dynamic, not anticipated, not thought about, not considered, but very real. The Russian government response was principally through their Federal Security Service, their counter-terror units, there's two of them. The Alpha Group, which is, uh, it has a long history of battling in Chechnya and of hostage crises. It's not an accurate comparison, but just to give you a ballpark, think of it as sort of the FBI's HRT, hostage rescue team. It's not a one for one, but I'm just trying to give you a sort of a what if. And then secondly, the Vimpel Group, which is the Spetsnaz, or Russian Special Forces Unit, attached to the SVR. <clears throat> the SVR is essentially the Russian CIA. It's their clandestine human uh, operation, but also has a paramilitary arm to it. F FS FSB took, came in, took control of all the negotiations. You saw the gentleman who was in there before, the retired Army General, speaking on their behalf. When Beslan happened, when the explosions occurred that kind of kicked off the very horrible end of this event, it was not a proactive FSB raid on the compound. For whatever reason, at some point, the terrorists detonated the explosive charges in the gym. There's conjecture over whether it was a sniper, an FSB sniper, who killed the guy who had his foot on one of the dead man switches, whether it was internal dissension, or whether it was just despair. And they said, screw it, you know, blow up the building, kill everyone. But it was a reactive operation by the FSB. This was not a planned raid. This was all, holy cow, what's happened, react to it which is in part why the casualty numbers are as high as they are. The FSB itself was actually the two large components of it, of these uh, Alpha and Vimple groups, were actually out training over an hour away, rehearsing and practicing a raid operation that they had planned to do. So they weren't even locally present. Huge losses for them, 10 FSB operators, most in the history. 
So inside the building at the very end, there's dehydration, exhaustion, people hallucinating, loss of consciousness. The children and the parents in the gym were reduced to drinking their own urine because they shut off all water and no food. Um, obviously, people who had other medical conditions were grossly complicated, right? So if you're a diabetic, you're on day three without insulin. I mean, you can fill in the blanks on this, right? Um, At a certain point, the hostages become numb to the threats of the terrorists. So when the guy's screaming, I told everyone to squat and keep your hands over your head, no one's there. I mean, they're simply not capable of responding. So instead, you have folks laying on the floor. They're unresponsive to the terrorist commands, which frustrates them. You can see how this cascades, right? Obviously, an enormous impact on very young children, not just on the children themselves, who are at the point of overload. You can't tell a three-year-old, shut up and put your hands up, right? This is not a cooperative hostage in the sense that they just don't understand or get it. All they are is scared. The terrorists themselves are affected by this. This is a case where they targeted a particular audience, a particular group of people they're going after, and I don't think that they appreciated or realized the other challenges, their, their operational challenges, as to what they were doing and how they were going to do it. And interestingly, uh, there's been a couple of papers and studies written on the impact of the security forces uh, there were electronic surveillance teams who were set up monitoring any sort of emanation coming out of that building. And there were, surveil there were security forces, the operators are listening, and when they sat listening to children cry hysterically in fear, hour after hour after hour, there's a consequence. So children are now eligible as targets, deliberate targets of terrorism. It's been endorsed. It's been rationalized. It's been documented. Here's the, a creepy part of this I want you to think about. This kind of an event is irresistible to media. Irresistible. How will they not cover it? And the point I made earlier, this is a specialized thing. This is not pull up with an ambulance and do your best, right? So suicide terror generally, highly effective. It's the ultimate spark bomb. It's devastating. Not only has it been sort of rationalized and justified, it's really quite simple and very inexpensive. And the family, the surviving family members, get a financial incentive. Go off and kill yourself. We'll take care of your parents forever. We'll bury them. Any attempts to profile have been incredibly ineffective. You've got everything from street kids who are barely literate to engineers and doctors and scientists. It's the full spectrum, men, women, it is virtually impossible to profile a suicide terrorist or a suicide bomber type. And here's the big question for security forces, right? How do you negotiate with people whose objective is their own death? Remember the Dubrovka theater siege. We want to die more than you want to live. What's your starting point for negotiation? How do you get there? So let's shift to America. We have this horrific experience that we should never forget. What about today in American schools? Let's go through some numbers. They speak for themselves, but let's just a quick summary. As of last fall, 50.7 million kids. And you see a breakout there by, by grade and by type of school. The schools themselves, nearly 100,000 of them, believe it or not. On any given day, 95% of the kids, 5 to 17, are in, in those schools. 
And 20% of schools have what's referred to euphemistically as school resource, resource officers. What does that mean? That means a local cop, right? Whether it's a deputy sheriff, city policeman, 20% of schools have at least one law enforcement officer. But even that's kind of sketchy because often you have one officer who's assigned to a whole district, so he's really covering three, four, five, six schools. So it's kind of sketchy. Uh, despite Beslan, the number in Russia, 6% of schools. But that gives you an idea on any given, you know, starting, well now, but going through, you know, next May, that's where 95% of the kids are in the country every day. So, after Beslan, <clears throat> I've been to some, done some research and writing on really an interesting phenomenon wherein Wahhabi Arabs were moving into Chechnya to further inflame and, and really uh, make their movement even more militant. And so I had done a study uh, for Columbia University on the topic we're talking about today. And in looking at that, I was asked, okay, uh, you've got kind of a weird background. Go dream up our own worst case scenario. And so I did. Um, no offense to Tucsonians and Arizonans here, but I put it in Tucson because I know Tucson. In my past life as an Army intelligence officer, I was hanging out in Sierra Vista for a couple of years. And so that's right next door. And I said, well, look, you know, uh, let's take a, a town, a city near a border that's easily porously crossed, has limited <clears throat> sort of uh, capabilities, facilities to respond. Let's dream up a scenario. And so what I'm going to talk through now is a, a Tucson scenario. Frankly, it could be anywhere. I put it in Tucson for a variety of reasons you'll see in a second. Uh, and everything I'm saying, you can find publicly, so I'm not, this is my nightmare scenario. Uh, it probably is more of a reflection of my thinking than it is on anything. So it's all publicly available. Nothing in here is classified. Nothing in here is you know, some kind of special technique or, or process or sort of, sort of classified information. But when I think we run through this and you think about it, you'll realize how dangerous our, our circumstances are. So the theory was come up with a coordinated militant Islamist attack on a on, on two schools, a hospital, and a police headquarters. All the stuff, like I said, is publicly available. The idea behind this being that a mass killing of non-combatants, especially kids, would be a terrorist act on par with 9-11. Sadly, there are some very favorable conditions for staging exactly this sort of thing in Tucson. There's a classified document it's a joint analysis by FBI and CIA called the Arizona Long Range Nexus of Islamic Extremists. And it talks specifically about what I'm talking about. I took Congressman Steve King down to the border a few years back, and I kind of walked him and talked him through the challenges faced on the border. I also took him to some hilltops where some cartel spotters actually sit on US soil on hilltops facing south and call their drug loads north. They're providing overwatch. In the context of doing that, Congressman King was stunned. I talked about this document, and I said, I can't get it. You know, we've FOIA'd it, we've sued for it. FBI claims they can't find it. CIA says they're not gonna answer us. But I know it exists. And so Congressman King's assistant calls over to FBI and says, hey, we'd like to see a copy of, uh, as soon as they uttered the title, did Farrell put you up to this? <laughs> Because uh, they know that I want this document for a variety of reasons. Um, so there's a loose number, about one and a half million through southeast Arizona. And it's all very sophisticated, very complex, highly monetized, cartel driven. Three principal routes into Tucson, one through the Alter Valley, one through Cochise County, and another through the Chiricahua Mountain Passes. I've got a, I'll show you a map in a second so that makes sense to you. Their objectives are real simple. One, get across the border. Two, make it to I-10. Three, get to Tucson. That's it. Those are the objectives. You can move 40 to 60 terrorists easily up those three corridors over a, three to, over a six to eight month period in small groups. They are raindrops in ocean waves, right? 
you can embed these folks in anywhere. For about 1,500 bucks in Mexico and Tampico, Mohammed becomes Manuel with legit paper. All the right stamps, seals, photos, right? That's the cost to get in legit. And they, they're raindrops in a, in a wave. So, <clears throat> Alter Valley, so here's quick orientation. There's Phoenix, here's Tucson, here's the border, that's Mexico. That's the Alter Valley, that's the, and of course, this is not straight shot, but just for orientation purposes, right? That's the Alter Valley. This is Cochise County, or the San Pedro River Valley, San Pedro Riparian District, that's what it's called. And then the third main route through here is the Chiricahua Mountains. Much rougher terrain, but much greater likelihood of getting in. Less patrolled, tough area to cross, but much lower visibility. So over the last, let's say, 15 years, there have been dozens of Middle Eastern males being reported apprehended at the border, specifically Adnan Shukajuma in Sonora, Mexico, but also Chihuahua. Adnan Shukajuma is a key factor, a key player, because he was the director of North American operations for Al-Qaeda. He was blessed by bin Laden himself. He's a Broward County, Florida kid. He's totally Americanized. He's also dead now, thank goodness. But in 2009, he was running a, a truck bomb plot out of El Paso, Texas. I'll show you a slide on that later. There's two incidents in the Chiricahua Mountains going back into 2004, where 77 males total over the two things. Caught by Border Patrol and then given a permiso, right? A permission slip to take off. It's a notice to appear. We'll see you in six months. And where did they go? Poof. And then just recently, I mean, this is as of earlier this month, Yemeni smuggled into Texas. There's, I mean, there's case after case after case after case of this. The Mexican foreign minister was remarkably frank a little over, well, I guess it's almost a year and a half ago. Claudia Ruiz, Ruiz talks about how the Obama administration in particular was actively suppressing information and news about the number of Middle Eastern males transiting Mexico coming into the United States. Ms. Ruiz was incredibly honest. She says, look, it's culpably neglecting this phenomenon. This new wave of fundamentalists could have a nasty surprise as it's of the United States. That's the Mexican foreign minister talking about our government attempting to suppress information about the numbers and types of persons entering the country unlawfully. So there's tremendous terrorist support in place in Tucson and elsewhere for that matter, and it comes in all different sort of flavors. So that's level one of the shooters, right? The actual bad guys, the guys who are gonna commit violence. Let's say level two are the people who are just willing to let a friend stay at, in their apartment. They'll drop somebody off at the Greyhound bus. They'll mail a package. That's sort of level two, right? They're not actively involved, but they're willing to sort of turn a blind eye, give somebody a break, help out. Oh, I didn't know he was, oh no, my friend told me he needed a place to stay, so I, right, that's that level, level two. And level three are people that just write checks every week. And they're giving to whatever, whatever foundation, but is that where the money's really going? But there's a hell of a lot of support in Tucson for that and elsewhere for that matter. Women are bulletproof when it comes to surveillance. <laughs> so let's say you wanna conduct a raid and seize a school in Tucson. And so one woman pulls up in her minivan, one kid by the hand, the other on the hip, into the school we go. What are they not gonna tell her? Nothing, they're gonna give her everything in the world. Here's our programs, here's our schedule, here's our this, here's our that. Hey, yeah, I'm moving into the neighborhood and we're just so excited to be here and da, da, da. Women are bulletproof at surveillance. They can go anywhere and do anything. So all these soft targets we're talking about, schools, hospitals, police stations, women can go in and get away with virtually anything. And we know that they'll do that. They're gonna use all the strategies and lessons from Beslan. They're gonna, they're gonna conduct this strike itself that I'll talk about in a second. They're going to use supplemental and diversionary attacks. So two schools and a hostage barricade situation, it's a disaster. Hundreds killed and wounded. 
these supplemental and diversionary tax, one at, let's say, the University of Arizona Medical Center and a second at, Phoenix, at uh, Tucson Police Headquarters, what do they result in? The attack and the siege themselves cripples the response. Two schools grabbed at once will make it ecumenical. We'll grab a public school and a Catholic parochial school. Everyone's watching media. As those are grabbed, somebody with a backpack walks into the emergency room. Somebody else goes to the police station under the guise of, I heard there's attack, I'm worried. The attack itself cripples the response. I've briefed all this to Tucson PD, and I get that look, right, the deer look, a lot of and big eyes, because they know it's true. Great guys, I'm not knocking them, but they had not necessarily thought through this. There's obviously huge, I can't go through all these because I want to stay, <clears throat> leave time for questions, but this is stuff that is just so painfully obvious, you got to think through it anyway, just to, just to enunciate it. The public health system response, security, when I say security, I just don't mean local police, because if the scenario I just described happens, there's going to be other folks that insert themselves. And I just don't mean FBI and ATF. I mean, there'll be a response from the world of special mission units, meaning Delta's going to show up, SEALs are going to show up. There's going to be another sort of armed response. And how you juggle all that is huge, which gets you to the third point, the command and authority. Who is in charge? We make the mistake of usually having about five people in charge. And that can be very deadly. The ability to synchronize and communicate among emergency response, fire, military, big, big questions. And the one that particularly always intrigues me is the bottom one, right? The media question. How is that handled? There's like, there's like a thousand angles to that. A thousand. This is not hypothetical. Earlier this month, I'm sure all of you know about this, right? Please tell me you do. Amalia, New Mexico, a compound, northern New Mexico. It really started out as a domestic, uh, domestic violence sort of, you know, child kidnapping thing. FBI sat on this compound for months and did nothing, zero. It was the local county sheriff, Tavs County Sheriff, who was going out on sort of a health and welfare check over the disputed custody of a child. Sadly, they found that child buried on the compound. Inside this compound, 150 foot long tunnel with a secret escape route, weapons caches, places to sleep. Here's what really creeps me out. Do you know what they've already done to this compound? Bulldozed it. Why? Hey, if I'm bringing a case against this bad guy, this lunatic here, who's the son of a bad guy, wouldn't I want to bring a jury out here, walk them through? Why is it bulldozed? A few years back in Minneapolis, <clears throat> an apartment complex occupied solely by Somali men blew up in a gas leak explosion. Before they could clear the, all the bodies out of the building, they were bulldozing it. Why? I sent an investigator there for three weeks. It, there's no good explanation. So these compounds are not unusual. This is a hat tip to a Clarion Institute. Ryan Morrow did some great work on this. There's a, a Jamat al Fukra runs these, these sites all over the country. There's actually, I think it's now upwards of 22, I believe, but you can see where they're sprinkled around. So this is not anything new or different or rare, but we have this sudden sort of amnesia where we either don't think about these sorts of subjects or all of a sudden we lose, we can't see in that spectrum of light anymore. We're blind to it. And we need to correct that, right? We need to recover the amnesia and broaden our ability to see in certain spectrums of light with respect to this. So some recommendations, obviously. You all realize that the Department of Homeland Security has no idea who's currently in the country, right? 
You know that. They don't have the slightest idea who's here. Whether it's visa overstays, or whether it's the human wave coming across the border, they don't know who's in the country. I'm not exaggerating. So it might be a good idea if we found that out. We should probably also secure our southern border. Uh, safe havens for terrorists. Mexico is an enormous problem. Again, we turn a blind eye to it. When it comes to school safety, hey, look, I'm the biggest proponent of the Second Amendment you're going to find. Life member of the NRA. I have a very rare document in my wallet. I have a DC concealed carry permit. How's that for rare, right? So I'm all for, I'm all for our Second Amendment, but what I'm saying with respect to school safety, the local decision is what needs to be made, right? Topeka, Kansas does not have a school security requirement the same as Arlington, Virginia. It just doesn't. And there's currently talk of creating essentially another TSA for school security, whether it be a federal program with federal, you know what TSA stands for, right? Thousands standing around? All right, we don't, we do not need a federal one size fits all. We need local school jurisdictions to decide what they need and how they need it. And I guarantee you, when you get a bunch of uncles and grandpas and brothers-in-law who are either former military, former law enforcement, or just good, smart guys, and you say, hey, you want to protect your grandkids? Guess what the answer is? Guess what the most effective school security you could ever imagine is? And all you got to do is give them a sandwich at lunch. They say, hey, thanks, and that's it. It would be essentially free. People would have skin in the game, their blood they're protecting. It would be the best school security program in the world. We guard everything else that we value, right? Banks, jewelry stores, VIP, Capitol Hill types. Everybody's got an arm detail. But what's our most precious thing? Right? So we just need to think through that a little bit. But the answer's got to be local, not some federal leviathan that we just can't ever shake again. Another jobs program for somebody. So, uh, pediatric mass casualty response protocol. In the last three years, we've had nearly 100 school shootings. All sorts of wackos, right? And again, I'm, not, I'm the most pro-Second Amendment guy you're going to find. But the fact is, in the last three years, almost 100 school shootings. So we need to have thought through it more than, hey, call all, you know, every ambulance for the next three counties. There's got to be something greater than that. I want to give a shout out to my friend and colleague, Dr. Steve Hatfield, because in the last 14 years of looking at this, and I look at it a lot, the best answer currently available on the books, in writing, planned, teachable, literally the PowerPoint slides are there, are his programs for tactical emergency casualty care and a rescue task force. So maybe some other date, some other time, he can talk about that. It's the best thing out there. And frankly, yeah, I think it's our answer. So thank you, Steve. <laughs> Should this Tucson scenario ever take place? There's some questions about media. There's a legitimate First Amendment journalistic right to cover what's the news and what's going on. But at what cost? The terrorists want CNN to show children's bodies being thrown out of a window. They want that. Does the American public have a right to know that? A cautious, well, yeah, because it's factual and it's true and it's horrific. Can't cover it up, can't lie about it. But where does that fit in the equation of what the terrorists hope to achieve? How does it paralyze the country? So it's just, these are very important questions. This idea of jujitsu, right? We're going to use their strength and effort and energy back against them. How do we do that? And stay true to the Constitution, true to legitimate journalism. Notice I say legitimate, right? Legitimate journalism. True to the public's right to know. These are not easy, easy questions to answer. But I think we need to bat them around. 
If you're interested more in about sort of all the weird creepiness that never gets reported concerning our border and terrorism, I'm not going to play it here, but the Sun City Cell is a documentary I made, 48 minutes. It's a narco-terror plot for truck bombing in Chicago, and it was based out of El Paso, Texas. Adnan Shukrajuma, I mentioned before, was the ringleader of it. A guy named Imad Karakra, who's been described to me as a crazy, dangerous thug, was set loose by the FBI in Chicago after he drove through the city at 80 miles an hour on a high-speed chase with an ISIS flag flying out of the side of his car. He pulled into a gas station, said, the car is rigged as a bomb. Chicago PD evacuated two city blocks around the gas station. The car wasn't rigged as a bomb. He was looking for suicide or martyred him by cop. He was hoping to be killed. He was freaking out because the rest of his ring in El Paso and in uh, Juarez, Mexico was being rounded up. Literally, there was a CIA paramilitary officer, a 7th Special Forces Group officer, and a squad of Mexican Marines kicking down doors in Mexican hotels looking for Imad Caracas' counterparts. That's why he freaked out. That's why he tried to have himself killed. Anyway, uh, again, uh, uh, this will be available to you electronically, but I encourage you to watch that. And now I'm going to do a little promotional. I'm changing for a second. This is a one-minute video. Hey, do you know that every single day we take the equivalent of a 737 load of people and fly it into a mountain and they all die? And we do nothing about it? You've heard about opioid epidemic and heroin. Do you know what's really killing people? Fentanyl. It's a synthetic. And it's used to lace, uh, used to lace heroin. So some of you may know Sarah Carter from Fox News. She's a good friend. We work together on a documentary. It's called Not In Vain, V-E-I-N. It'll be out in October. Production was finished Saturday. Not just the production, the actual editing, composition, and everything else. So um, the equivalent of a plane load of people overdoses and dies from fentanyl every single day in this country. How many times would we watch planes fly into a mountain on the daily news and say, oh, well, oh, well. I was talking to the Franklin County coroner in Ohio. Ohio is actually the epicenter of heroin uh, and opioid abuse in the country, believe it or not. Franklin County coroner, which is uh, Columbus, talking to her, they had to go out and go get refrigeration trucks to hold all the bodies because they had overflowed their capacity at the, at the county morgue. And so I said, well, you know, this heroin thing, opioid, she goes, no, 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 let's be very clear. All the dead bodies in my morgue, it's all fentanyl. It's a horrific problem. Anyway, let me show you something. Here's my solution, a one-sentence order to the Department of Defense, secure the southern border of the United States, declare the cartels to be foreign terrorist organizations, FTOs. They're currently designated as foreign transnational criminal organizations, and that just isn't cutting it. When they're declared to be what they are, terrorist organizations, you give the Mexican government a choice. They can cooperate and get on board and help us to fight them as what they are, terrorist organizations, or we can do it ourselves. But making those designations would change the playing field dramatically. So look for that October 1st. We take it all the way from the border, all the way into Columbus, Ohio. Sarah Carter, myself, and a very, very brave former gang member, now pastor in Columbus, walking the streets to see what the impact is. It's powerful stuff, and uh, I hope you see it. So that's me, and I'm on time, I think. I am, and I'm ready for any questions.